Okay, so let's start going through acid and base questions. And we'll just make sure we get a good selection um, out of them. So this first question, when you're comparing one mole solution of bases, the bases with the lowest OH concentration. Now, if you have the same concentration of the base, but you've got a lower concentration of OH minus, then the only reason that would happen is because one base is stronger than another, because of course, spaces will then dissociate and well, react to form an OH minus. So if you've got a lower amount of OH minus, then it's got to be a weaker base, uh, a stronger base, I mean. If it's a lower amount of OH minus, then it's a weaker base because the more OH minus, the stronger the base it is. So it's a weaker base and a weaker base would therefore have a lower KB value. So I'll be C. Eight, pure water self ionizes by the equation shown. So this is called the self ionization of water, of course. We know that this has a KW of 10 to the negative 14 at 25 degrees Celsius, which you'll note here as well. And that's what you normally use. But as we already covered with equilibrium constants, they depend on temperature. So here, clearly, you've got a variation of temperature. And you can see that the number varies. And so the key thing you should probably notice is as the temperature goes up, look at what happens to the K value. You've got 10 to the minus 15. So minus 14 to minus 13. So KW increases. And if you think about it a little bit, if you increase the temperature, KW increases, meaning that it will shift to the right. That suggests that the forward reaction is endothermic. Given this data, which one of the following statements about pure water is correct? So the OH minus concentration will decrease with increase in temperature. Well, that's definitely wrong because we know it will shift to the right. So A is definitely wrong. H0 plus will increase with increase in temperature. That looks good. Its pH will increase with increase in temperature. Well, that's not right. And because of course, let's just take an example. If you've got something like 100 degrees, then we know H3O plus times OH minus equals 5.6 times 10 to the negative 13. In other words, because these two are equal to each other, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. That means this squared will equal 5.6 times 10 to the negative 13. So you can work this out itself. And that's going to give you seven point four eight times ten to the negative seven, mm. which then of course you can work out pH of six point one three. So clearly, as temperature goes up, pH goes down. And it's definitely also not always seven at any temperature. And that's why here, B is the correct answer. Mm -hmm. Which combination could you use to prepare a buffer solution? So the key to understand is that a buffer solution is, needs to be composed of a weak acid and its conjugate base. The key is it has to be weak. And the other thing you need as well that you don't need to, that doesn't affect this question, is that you need, well, ideally equimolar amounts. Here, they didn't give you molar amounts, so it doesn't matter. But the point is, sulfuric acid is a strong acid, so it's not that. Nitric acid is a strong acid. Now, you're left with here, ethanoic is acid is a weak acid. Yeah. And it's Weak, conjugate base, base, so it looks like D works. The thing with this one, of course, is that neither of these 
are acids, so it won't work. It's not, they're not conjugate bases, acid base of each other is, is probably more, the, the more correct thing that we're saying. So they're not conjugate acid base pair. So that's why D is your answer. Hmm. Which one of the following statements about 10 mils of 0.1 mole per liter HCl? And 10 mils of 0.1 mole per liter is true. So you've got 10 mils, same concentration. One's HCl, which is a strong acid, and one's CH3COH, which is a weak acid. Each solution will have the same electrical conductivity. Well, that's not true because the strong acid will fully dissociate, whereas the weak acid will not. Which means that when it's just in your solution, you're going to get the full amount of this all dissociated into ions, which gives you your conductivity. Whereas this one will have a very small amount of ionizing. And as a result, the electrical conductivity will not be the same. The HCl will have a higher electrical conductivity compared to the um, acetic acid. Each solution will react completely with 10 mils of 0.1 moles and AOH. That one looks fine. So remember, even though one is a strong acid and one is a weak acid, as far as stoichiometric ratios go, you can ignore that fact. You will still need to react with 10 mils of 0.1 NaOH. And the reason for that sometimes confuses students. Now, it's probably quite clear that you need this amount to react with a hydrochloric acid just because 10 mils 0.1, 1H plus, 10 mils 0.1, 1OH minus, that looks very clear. A lot of students think that you would need less base to react with the acid when it's weak. Now, the reason that's not true is because when you add the base, when you add the NaOH, yes, at the start, you won't have as much H plus compared to HCl. So yes, at the start, you're going to react with H plus and you're going to get rid of this H plus and you might have more OH minus left. Okay, so, so if you add all of this in one go, yes, you're going to have more OH minus than acetic acid could provide at the start. But the thing is this, this is the weak acid, which means there's a lot of the acetic acid that hasn't ionized. And when your OH minus reacts with the H plus, this concentration of the H plus has gone down. And as this is a reversible reaction, when the concentration of H plus has gone down, that means this will now push the equilibrium to the right. And so what will happen is it will continually push the equilibrium to the right until the entire amount of the ch 3 so h has neutralized. And so indeed the answer is B. Quickly looking at C and D, um, each solution will react at the same rate. No, the stronger acid will react faster for the fact it's got a higher ion concentration. And the concentration of h 3 plus will be greater than the ch 3 so h solution, which is definitely false. So we want to write two net ionic equations showing the antiprotic behavior of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Now, the sodium hydrogen carbonate, predominantly, it's the HCO3 minus ion that is amphiprotic. Amphiprotic just means, of course, that it can either donate or accept a proton. So let's just show it acting with at base, and that's of course going to come CO3 two minus plus H2O. You can also of course react with, you can also accept the proton, come H2CO3, plus OH minus, uh, plus H2O. We now need to identify one conjugate acid-base pair. And so we've got lots of pairs here, really. 
So pair number one is HCO3 minus. And that is then paired with CO3 two minus. So that's the conjugate acid, that's the conjugate base. Another pair is your OH minus is the conjugate base with H2O, which is the conjugate acid. We could have gone with another pair here. HCO3 minus in this case will be the conjugate base with H2CO3 being the conjugate acid. Or alternatively, H3O plus being the conjugate acid with H2O being the conjugate base. In these two equations that we've written, you've got these four pairs. Okay, so question 30 is kind of like a question that we just need to memorize how to do. I um, mean, you may have done this experiment, not recently, but you may have done it say, last year or even in prior year in science. So you just need to be able to outline the certain um, steps that you would do to do certain experiments. And we'll use this as an example of how to do that. So you've got most plants contain pyrosensitive pigments, making some of them ideal for use as a natural indicator. So a natural indicator you may have used is with pink cabbage. So we might say, cut up the pink cabbage into pieces. And then once we cut it up into pieces, then we would place in, let's say, 500 milliliter beaker and add water. Three, we would place the beaker on a Uh, or tripod and gauze mat and heat with Bunsen burner until boil. And then maintain heat for 20 minutes, then allow it to cool. And then we will simply strain slash filter the mixture and keep the solution to act as indicator. Okay, B. Explain why the natural indicator solution you prepare can be used to quantitatively determine the acidity or basicity of a solution. In your response, include a suitable chemical equation. So basically they're asking how do indicators work? So we'll just need to basically explain. Indicators are able to qualitatively determine the acidity or basicity of a solution based on changing colors.
Okay, so we can then, in, the, in our answer, we should then talk about the colors that our indicator would turn. So for example, we would say, Okay, so basically when it's red or pink, it's going to be an acid. And when it's in a base, it will turn sort of bluish green. So EG. In acidic solution. It will appear the pink or red, and turn to the green in alkaline solution. Now, of course, we then need to explain why this is the case, okay. because it asks for a why. And so, and with along with your chemical equation. So we will say, this is because a indicator is made up of a mixture of a weak acid, conjugate acid, um, weak acid base conjugate pair. with at least one having a color, you know, different colors. So basically you're going to have say HA and it's going to dissociate into let's say H plus plus A minus. So for example, one of them is one color and then when it dissociates into this situation, then one will be the other color. So for example, when you're in very acidic conditions, your H plus concentration is very high. That means the equilibrium wanna shift left. So you have more H A and not much A minus. So this could be sort of red or pink. On the other hand, when you've got in, when you're in a, um, basic conditions, they'll oh, react with the H plus. So this will be very low, you'll shift to the right, meaning you'll have more A minus in this big blue. So basically, as a result of add putting your indicator in either acidic or basic conditions, you're basically letting this equilibrium system have different amounts of H plus which will then shift the equilibrium to the right or to the left, according to Le Chatelier's principle, and giving you different concentrations of either the acid or its conjugate base. And the key thing with the indicator is that at least one of these has a color. And that's basically that indicator's work. Explain how bus work with reference to a specific example in a natural system. So the way the buffer system works is very similar to what we just discussed with the indicator, actually. It relates to the equilibrium system. Now, you want to talk about um, a natural system. So you can talk about, for example, the carbon dioxide buffer system and carbonic acid. So we would firstly say, a buffer system maintains the pH level of a system 
within a feeling error range, despite the addition of a small amount of acetyl base. And through the adjustment of the equilibrium position. of the system. So we'll say what a buffer system includes. So it consists of a weak conjugate acid base pair. So it consists of a weak conjugate acid base pair in equimolar amounts. such as with H2CO3 and HCO3 minus. So we might have this with water to give you an H3O plus plus HCO3 minus. So this is an important natural buffer system that is used in our blood and also in, in waterways and so forth to maintain pH in a sort of narrow range. So in this scenario, if the pH is too high, in other words, small amount of acid is added, then that means the concentration of H3O plus is high, which then means that by Le Chatelier's principle, the system will shift left. Which then reduces the increase in the H2O plus concentration, therefore maintaining pH in a relatively stable range. Of course, if you added base, then the reverse would happen. If you added base, if base is added, then it will react and neutralize. Therefore, that means the H3O plus concentration will suddenly decrease, which then will cause a right shift in the forward direction. We cause a shift in the forward direction. And therefore reducing the decrease in the concentration of H2O plus. And therefore, again, maintaining pH within a relatively narrow range. Okay, four. What is the pH of a 0.01 mole per liter solution of sodium hydroxide? So we can just quite easily see, of course, that the OH minus concentration being one to one will be 0.01, .01, which means pH is two, which of course means pH is 12. The following table shows the color changes and pH ranges of three indicators, bromothalmol blue, methyl orange, and alizarin. Okay. Now, you do need to know off the top of your head, bromothalmol blue, methyl orange, and phenophthalene. Okay. The colors and the rough change. So methyl red or methyl orange changes around the acidic range. Bromothalmol blue changes in the neutral. Oh, right, this is bromophenyl blue, it's a different one. Okay, so you do need to know bromothymol blue, which changes in the neutral range, and you've got phenophthalein, which changes in the sort of acidic range. Now, these are not your standard indicators that you have to know off the top of your head, but you just better understand that there's two different colors, and you've got sort of certain range. So these are not the ones you need to know. 
are slightly different. So the indicators were used to test the liquid, which then gives you these results. Of course, if it is blue, that means it's on this side, which means it's greater than 4.5. If it is yellow, that means it's greater than 6.3. And if it's yellow, that means it's less than 10.2. So you know you've got something in the range of 6.3 to 10.2, which would unlikely be vinegar or bleach. And between rainwater and distilled water, uh, distilled water would be the better choice here. Because rainwater will be slightly acidic. Um, and while that's debatable as to how acidic it is, it could usually be in the you know, high five, low six. So distilled water being seven will be a better choice. So we've done very many of these questions before. So let's just quickly see if we can find more. Okay. So we've got a 50 ml sample of a solution containing chloride. It was titrated with 27.3 ml of 0.1 mol per liter of silver nitrate to reach the endpoint using potassium chromate as the indicator. Calculate the mass of chloride in the original sample. So, got chloride. You know the volume is 50 ml. And you're titrating it against silver nitrate. You know you're going to get AgCl plus nitrate. Now, you know the volume of this silver nitrate is 27.3 ml. And you know the concentration is 0 0.15. So it's a one-to-one -one scenario. So you can work out the N. Give you an answer of 4.1 times 10 to the negative 3. That, of course, means the number of moles of chloride is also equal to 4.1 times 10 to the negative 3. Now, if we know the number of moles of chloride, then to get the mass, it's just going to equal times 35.45. So that's going to equal 0 0.415. So the 50 mil doesn't really make much of a difference here. Five, Arrhenius' theory. So you do need to know different theories. The key ones, the two key ones you have to know are Arrhenius and Brassavari. You should also know the ones before, so Lavoisier and Davy. And you can also, in an extended response question, make passing reference to Lewis after Brassavari. But remember, Arrhenius means that acids dissociate or ionize to form H plus, bases dissociate to form OH minus. So it should be fine with A and B. So it doesn't explain this last one. Because you can see that here the water is accepting an H plus. So there's no OH minus in this one. Okay, there's no base. So I mean in the first one you've got the H plus and you've got the OH minus. In the second one, you've got the ionization to H plus. In the third one, you've got the ionization to H plus. All right. Um, and the, the reaction with that. So D doesn't work. So we've done a very similar one with relative to temperature before, and this is just in graphical form, so we'll skip that one. These questions all seem okay. All right, so let's do a calculation question. We've got boric acid, 
H3PO3 is a weak acid. Let's conjugate base the borate ion existing in water as BOH4 minus. A solution of pure sodium borate, NaBOH4, is prepared in water at 25 degrees Celsius. The borate ion dissociates according to the equation BOH4 minus aqueous to OH minus aqueous plus H3BO3. At equilibrium, in a particular solution of NaBOH4, the concentration of BOH4 minus is exactly 0 0.1, and the pH is 11.11. Okay. Calculate the hydrogen ion and hydroxyl ion concentrations in the solution. Well, the hydrogen ion concentration is very easy because if the pH is 11.11, then we of course know that the H plus ion concentration will equal 10 to the negative 11.11 by definition, which means it's 7.76. Now, you can do this in multiple ways. You can directly use Kw, for example, but we will just relate perhaps to POH. So if pH is 14, POH is, uh, if pH is 11.11, POH is 14 minus 11.11, which is 2.89. And then for the concentration of OH minus, we tend to the power of negative 2.89. Which gives you 1.29 times 10 to the Multiple. So, hence give the concentration of H3BO3 concentration in the solution. Well, we know that looking at this equation, you start with this and you're going to dissociate into 1 OH minus and 1H3PO3. Since we already worked out the concentration of OH minus and it's a one to one ratio, then it's simply going to equal this number. So that's just going to equal 1.29 times 10 to the negative three. Okay, so let's talk about extended response question. So for eight marks, this relates to what we said earlier, we need to know your different sort of acid-based theories. So you've got multiple acid-based theories have been devised, each more refined than its predecessor. It asks you here to describe the Arrhenius, Bronston-Lowry, and at least one other named acid-based theory. Discuss the relationship between these theories, including the limitations, use relevant equations to support your answer. So for eight marks, I suggest that we do a more thorough sort of evaluation. So you might want to give a historical perspective and then focus predominantly on the ones they talked about, Arrhenius and bronson lowry And then you can just continue and talk about each one's limitations and their theories. So we would probably start, and we would start with the first two, okay? So we would say acids were first defined by their chemical position, uh, composition by Lavoisier, okay? Who theorized that acids contained oxygen as a definition. So I won't write it all out in sort of prose, I'll probably say things, but so Lavoisier first defined acids as containing oxygen, right? And 
and he did not have a definition of a base. And critically, it's clearly with our understanding nowadays that this is wrong. For example, HCl is an acid, but it doesn't contain oxygen. And NaOH contains acid, it is, is, contains oxygen, but is a base. So Lavoisier's theory was clearly wrong. And this was shown by Davy, who came next who then basically said that by through his discovery of the chemical composition of HCl, he then devised an alternative refined theory, building on Lavoisier, who started the process, by saying that an acid, well, is contained replaceable hydrogen. And again, no definition of a base. This was then further refined by Arrhenius, And that's when we're going to start to give a bit more detail in our answers now. So this was further refined by Arrhenius, who defined acids as substances that formed H plus ions in solution. Arrhenius was also the first person to define a base specifically, not as just something that reacts with an acid. And he defined a base as a substance that formed hydroxide ions in solution. Well, then this was the first sort of more comprehensive theory regarding acids. Now, the thing is, although it was a fairly complete theory, it was able to explain a lot of things. So it explained neutralization, right? So it was able to explain sort of neutralization. The fact that it's exothermic, why all base, acids and bases more or less react the same way, and so forth and so forth. But what it cannot explain is the idea of amphiprotic substances or amphoteric substances. So it can't explain why certain substances can react both with acids and bases. It could not explain why they were acidic or basic salts. He also really couldn't explain properly the basic nature of ammonia, such as when ammonia reacts with HCl to form NH4Cl because there are no ions, H plus ions or OH minus ions and no solutions involved there. Now, he, basically, he was able to explain though that basically acids such as HCl will dissociate to form H plus plus the elements. And of course, he's able to show that, for example, NaOH is going to form Na plus plus OH minus. So with limitations like these in mind, that he's unable to explain why some salts are acidic or basic, why he's not really able to explain sort of NH3, it also disregards the role of a solvent because some solvents will form H plus ion in solution. With, with some substances will form an H plus ion in a solution with one solvent, but not with another, which then complicates whether you will or won't call that an acid. So bronson lowry then further expands on this definition and says, well, an acid is basically any substance which is a proton donor. And a base is a substance that's a proton acceptor. Now, 
the Bross and Lowry definition of an acid base is very inclusive. So any base that is an Arrhenius space is also a Bross and Lowry acid or base. And we would then show the difference using equations, okay, to show how it's regarded differently. So in terms of Bross and Lowry, we would include the water. And we will now demonstrate that it's an hydromion ion, not just a hydrogen ion in isolation. And if you have, for example, then you can see that you'll get your NaCl, but you'll get your H2O. In other words, you have now given it your H plus. It has accepted an H plus. So with the thinking, of course, that now you've got these things, what Bros and Larry was definitely able to address was why certain things were amphiprotic and amphoteric. It was able to explain why salts were acidic or basic. It was able to explain ammonia because, of course, ammonia can then accept an um, H plus to become an H4 plus ammonium ion. And it specifically invest, includes the role of a solvent. But it is still unable to include certain reactions as. it's still unable to include certain reactions as acid base. So that then leads us to the next theory, which is Lewis. Now, Lewis is not formally in your syllabus, but this question simply, you know, doesn't, is asking about the acid base theories, each being more refined and its predecessor. So, I would place most on the focus on Arrhenius and Bronson Lowry. It says at least one other named acid base theory, and it's not very restrictive. So I think you can, it, yeah, you're perfectly justified in talking about Lewis when they're talking about the evolution of the theories. But I would definitely spend most, and have, and we should spend most of the time talking about Arrhenius and Bronson Lowry. So the Lewis theory, you can then say, you know, is further refined our definitions so that. An uh, acid is the electron pair acceptor. And electron pair donor. And you can basically just make the point, you don't have to take too much, talk too much about the Lewis, but you can just basically make the point that it is even more expensive than Bronson Lowry, includes equations, and you can write one out, um, you know, with boron tetrachloride, for example, and ammonia. And then basically show that this definition and our limitations are continuing to evolve. And so this, this sort of research and so forth is continuing. Okay. Now, one thing I probably would add here with Arrhenius is that not only is it able to explain neutralization and exothermic, but it does also explain sort of the strength of acids and bases, the partial ionization. And if you want to write all of that well in a nice logical manner with equations, of course, describing the relationship between these theories, which is you know, this set off the process, it was then refined, this is your first sort of comprehensive one, had limitations, which is then more inclusive by Bronson Larrick, which is then further inclusive, more inclusive again by limitation um, by Lewis, then you should be having more than enough for eight marks there. So we've really talked a lot about these already. So let's now see if there are any other key questions that we want to look at here. If not, we'll move on to titration questions, which is something that we'll really need to look at as well. OK, so we'll do some calculations here first, and then we'll move on to titration calculations. So 
you've got a student dissolved 1.25 grams of calcium hydroxide in 1.5 liters of water, calculate the pH of the solution. So if firstly we work, need to work out the number of moles of calcium hydroxide. Now the number of moles of calcium hydroxide will be M divided by molar mass. We've got 1.25 all over So calcium should be around 40. I'll we'll just double check that. So yes, it's basically 40.07 plus 17 times two. Giving us an answer of 1.69 times 10 to the minus two. Now, if we assume all of it dissolves, and we might want to check if it can in a moment in terms of with the data sheet um, against the KSP, but in this question, it seems to suggest that everything is fully dissolved. Okay. So if it's, if the N is CaOH2, and it's 1.69 times 10 to the minus two, then of course we know calcium hydroxide is then going to dissolve with CH2 plus plus 2 OH minus. Okay, so that means the concentration of OH minus will equal be double this. And then of course your pOH will be minus log base 10 of that, which is 1.47 which of course means your pH will be 12.53. So that is assuming it dissolves. Uh, well, actually we've made a mistake here. So the thing is we worked out the number of moles and not the concentration. So there was a mistake there. So we know it's 1.69 times 10 to the minus two is the number of moles, but that then means, of course, the concentration of CaOH2 is 1.69 times 10 to the minus two divided by 1.5. N over B. Give you an answer of 1.13 times 10 to the minus 2. And then the OH minus will then be double this. Which is going to be 2.25 times 10 to the minus 2. Which then of course means your pH will be 1.65. And you can answer all 
That doesn't quite make sense. We've got a slightly, oh, it does. We've got 12.5 before. So yes, it went down a little. Okay. Now, the next thing we should note, of course, is consider whether or not it actually should all dissolve. So we should quickly check the KSP value. Now, the way this question is written, it really should fully dissolve. Otherwise, it's, um, but we'll just quickly check. So the KSP of calcium hydroxide according to your data sheet is 5.02 times 10 to the negative six. So if you were to take your calcium, so that's gonna be your calcium times your OH minus concentration all square, which should equal 1.13 times 10 to the minus two, times 2.25 times 10 to the minus two all square. We can answer of 5.72 times 10 to the negative six, which means unfortunately it won't actually fully dissolve because this Q is too large, right? It's too high, which means it won't actually fully dissolve. So that means you'll, when you try to dissolve 1.25 grams of calcium hydroxide in 1.5 liters of water, you're going to be left with some left. So the way this question is written, I'm not sure if they're intending for you to recognize that, but actually, because the KSP is 5.02 times 10 to the negative six, and we would exceed that, then you're going to have some left as precipitate, which means the pH actually won't be that high. So if we were to calculate it based on the KSP, which would limit, would limit it, we can get CH2 plus times OH minus four squared. Now that's going to become X times two X or squared, which is four X or cubed, which is 5.02 times 10 to the negative six. So that means your X, which represents the OH minus concentration will equal 1.08 times 10 to the negative two, which means your POH is going to be 1.97, which means your pH will be, well, 12 basically. So in reality, this should be an answer here. All right. So the next one, it says determine whether precipitation will occur when 100 mils of two times 10 to the negative three mole per liter of calcium chloride solution, 100 mils of four times 10 to the negative three mole per liter sodium sulfate are mixed. Show sure, all working. Okay. So let's write out our equation first. You're going to get calcium chloride with sodium sulfate. And you're going to get sodium chloride plus calcium sulfate, which is typically not very soluble. Now you need to balance this, of course. And now you have a balanced equation. Now, you know that 
you're mixing 100 ml. Which is 0 0.1 billions with 2 times 10 to the negative 3 molecular weight of calcium chloride with 100 ml of 4 times 0 times 10 to the negative 3 molecular of sodium sulfate. So You're going to therefore get a combined volume of 200 mils, which is 0 0.2 liters. Now, essentially, your chloride concentration is, I mean, you can work out the number of moles of chloride which is going to be C times V, which is the number of moles of calcium chloride, and then your chloride moles would be double that, okay? And then you're going to divide by two because you're doubling the volume. So we could do all those calculations, or we could do it conceptually, but let's do all the calculations just to, just to you know, I guess, dot our I's and cross our T's. So the number of moles of calcium chloride will be C times V, which is, 0 0.1 times 2 times 10 to the negative 3, which of course is 2 times 10 to the negative 4. So that's a moles, number of moles of calcium chloride. Now, that means the number of moles of chloride will be 2 times that, which is 4 times 10 to the negative 4. The volume of the combined is 0 0.2. So the concentration would equal N over B which is 4 times 10 to the negative 4 divided by V, which is 0.2. So that's 2 times 10 to the negative 3. Molecular of the chloride ion. Okay. Now, you can probably have seen that that would be the concentration by recognizing that this is the concentration of CaCl2 so that the concentration of the chloride will be four times 10 to the negative three, okay? And then we're going to double the volume, which will halve it, which gives us that. The other one we, thing we need to care about is the concentration of the sulfate, right? So we could sort of do the working out again with all of this, so work out the number of moles of sodium sulfate, then work out the number of moles of sulfate, and then work out, divide it by the new volume, but I think in this case, it's quite clear, or in both cases, it's quite clear, but it's even clearer now. The sulfate is the same amount in number of moles as the sodium sulfate. So you can work out the amount of moles of sulfate, but the point is the volume doubles. So the concentration of sulfate will halve compared to before. It will be 2.0 times 10 to the negative 3. So we've now worked out the concentration of the chloride ion. and which I actually didn't need. Why am I doing the concentration of chloride ion? I should have worked out the concentration of calcium ions. Okay. Um, so that, that was rather pointless there. So the number of moles of calcium chloride is two times 10 to the minus four. The number of moles, this, this is really not required, not required for our purposes. So the number of moles of calcium will therefore, of course, be 2 times 10 to the negative 4. The volume, of course, is 0 0.2. So the concentration of calcium, of course, is now going to be 1 times 10 to the negative 3. And these are what we want. So we recognize that if there's going to be any sort of precipitation, that's going to result from basically looking at your Ksp. So looking this up, we'll note that the Ksp value on your data sheet, calcium sulfate is 4.93 times 10 to the minus one. So we can basically now just work out our Q, okay? 
So we've already got both the calcium ion concentration and the sulfate ion concentration. So Q must equal Ca2 plus times SO4 to the minus, meaning you've got 1 times 10 to the negative 3 multiplied by 2.0 times 10 to the negative 3, which of course would be 2 times 10 to the negative 6. And importantly, this number is less than that. Because this number is less than, than the KSP, that means it, you can kind of keep dissolving. So therefore, no, self, uh, no precipitate is formed. Okay, so let's now move on to the different sheet focusing on the titration questions. So let's take at something like question 19. Here, You've got a graph shows ch changes in pH during the titration of equal volumes of two monoprotic acids, acid one and acid two. So we've got two acids, they're both monoprotic. Now you'll notice that acid one reacts with this pH curve. Very importantly, you'll note that it starts very low uh, from like about two or three and it goes all the way to like 10 or 11. So that's very strongly indicating that acid one is a strong acid because the equivalence point is about seven and it's got this very steep curve from around three to 11. So this fact that it's got an equivalence point means that it's a strong acid. Acid two on the other hand, you can see that its equivalence point is around sort of eight or nine. And it, the steep section of the curve only goes from around sort of seven to around 10. So the fact that you've got an equivalence point here suggests that this is a weak acid. Further indications that acid two is a weak acid and acid one is a strong acid, apart from the equivalence point, is the fact that you can see that acid two here has this sort of concave down followed by a concave up. That's sort of the buffering action of the weak acid that you can see, the fact that it's you know, got this concave up. You, some students would also argue that the, you're starting from a pH of one, which suggests it's strong, and it's starting from a pH you know, which is greater than one, say two or three. Now those might, help to indicate or hint at it, but it's not as important as the equivalence point, as well as the shape of the curve itself. So it's quite clear acid one is strong and acid two is weak. So those are out. Now the question now comes down to a question of concentration. Now, when it comes to concentration, what you really need to look at considering that both of them are monoprotic and they're reacting with KOH, is how much of the, and, and they have equal volumes, importantly, is basically how much space you need to react with. So acid one takes this much, so like around 25 mils, to fully neutralize. Acid two takes more, so let's say 37 mils, whatever it is, it's more than acid one because it's further to the right of your volume. Given that they're equal volumes, given they're both monoprotic, that then would suggest acid two is more concentrated and therefore acid one is stronger, but less concentrated than acid two would be the appropriate answer there. Done questions like that. Okay, so let's take a look at, say, this question. So you've got the concentration of a sample of nitric acid was determined by using 1.01 mole per liter of ammonia solution. A 25 mil aliquot of the ammonia solution was added to the conical flask, and a few drops of methyl orange were added. The mixture was shaken, giving a pale yellow color. 
the endpoints of four titrations are shown below. Well, actually, they've got five titrations shown below. But as usual, you want to discard any outliers. And if you take a look at your data, number one, which is usually the outlier, but not always, is quite a bit higher than the others. In fact, number four also looks a bit higher than the others. So you might want to discard both of them because 36.9 and 37.8, they're both quite a bit higher. Now, the fact that this has four titrations and they showed five probably suggests that this was probably a modified exam question. So the original question probably had four, and then whoever made this paper probably decided to add an extra one and just forgot to change the wording. Okay. Now, you've got nitric acid, and you're using 1.01 mole per liter of ammonia solution to do it. So you want to write a balanced equation, All right? So ammonia. is reacting with nitric acid. And that will give you ammonium nitric. So I've got the concentration of a sample of nitric acid and so forth. Okay, and of course, this is a strong acid with a weak base. Nitric acid is of course a strong acid. Ammonia is of course a weak base. Um, and given that, you're going to end up with the fact that you're going to have an equivalence point in the acidic range, which is why they're using methyl orange. Now you want to calculate the concentration of the acid, show you're working and explain how you came to a value for the endpoint. So I guess the value of the endpoint, of course, means we need to average the ones we want. So we'll, as we said, exclude one and four here as the outliers. Now we will need the volume of the ammonia solution, which we know is 25 mils. Which is 0.025 meters. And we know the concentration is 1.01. .01. So from that, we can work out the N. Okay, now on the nitric acid side of things, the volume is going to be 36.1 plus 36.2 plus 36.1 all over 3 in mils. Which means it's 36.13 mils which of course means it's 0 0.03613 liters. Now the concentration is clearly unknown. If we knew the concentration, we wouldn't be doing the titration. But do we know the number of moles of the nitric acid solution is equal to the number of moles of ammonia here in our equation, which then means, of course, it's the 0 0.02525. And therefore the concentration of HNO3 is of course N over V. Which of course is therefore going to be 0 0.6988 mole per liter. And the other thing you now need to consider is the number of significant figures because this was given three significant figures, this was given three significant figures, all of these were three significant figures. This question strongly suggests that your answer should be in three significant figures, and so we'll explicitly make it so. And so we'll say it's 6.99, rounding up, of course, times 10 to the negative one, all per liter. So three significant figures. So when the HSC question is marked, there will be one question where they will care about the number of significant figures. It's usually very clear which question that is because every single thing they give you will be in the same number of significant figures. 
And in the marking scheme, they'll make sure they've got one mark allocated to significant figures for that question. If you do the right number of significant figures for that question, then you'll get the mark. If you don't do the right number of significant figures for that question, then you won't get the mark, obviously. And usually there will only be one question where they care about it. They won't take one mark off for each time you lose, you know, you have the wrong number of significant figures. They'll just check at one particular question. It's usually reasonably clear which question that is, as long as you're on the lookout for it. On the axis provided, sketch the shape of the expected titration curve for this titration. And they've been very nice to tell you to label the axis appropriately. So this will be the volume of HNO3 added. This will be pH. Now, remembering, of course, that it is NH3 plus HNO3, and we're adding more and more nitric acid. So we're going to be, this is a week base, we're going to start in a sort of basic thing. So I won't really have uh, a ruler available to me here, but you should make graduations. And ideally, I think, um, ideally they would have given you graph paper um, and you could, I mean, they, they really are looking more for the shape than, than the actual graph. So the shape is probably more important, but just make sure you label the axes. Now, because of the weak base with a strong acid, you, have, as we said, the sort of equivalence point sort of more down here around, and you have a nitric acid, so you're going to head towards like around one. This will kind of be more around a sort of three mark. And as it's a weak base, it should sort of plateau out of, around the sort of five, sort of six mark. And then you should basically see that it will kind of go down and do that sort of thing. So it will have this shape where it's sort of it's concave up and concave down. The equivalence point will be this, this, this will start probably relatively low at around, let's say, 10. And then it will sort of drop down. And then at this vertical part, it's going to be sort of on the acidic side already. So probably around the six, you know, six mark. And then it will drop down to sort of, let's say, high twos, and they'll do this. So that's the general idea. The key things you need to watch out for are the shape, where you start, your equivalence point, where you end, and the axis. Okay. So here we've got a conduction titration between acid and a base. So we'll note the shape is very clearly a B shape. So as you add more base, the conduction goes down and then it kind of goes up. That's strongly indicative of a strong acid and a strong base. If you didn't have a strong acid or a strong base, then it wouldn't be quite like a V, it kind of go flat or it will be flat and then go up. So yeah, those are conduction ones. And, and the reason why there's a V shape is basically because the conductivity derives from the concentration of ions. So because you've got the concentration of ions that will give you the conductivity, which then explains um, the shape of the graph because as you add more, they will react and the number of ions will therefore decrease. Let's find let's do a quick question on back titration.
Okay, so back titration is just, it's titration, but there's two steps. One step is react with excess reagent deliberately, usually because whatever you're trying to work out is not something that you can just easily put into solution. So you react it with um, a reagent such as your acid, and then you work out the excess reagent that is left using your titration. So for example, we've got a pharmaceutical company claims that their pain relieving tablets contain 100% aspirin. To determine the actual percentage of by mass of aspirin in an aspirin tablet, you, what we did was we took three aspirin tablets, each with 300 milligrams, were crushed and dissolved in excess sodium hydroxide solution, okay? Exactly 100 mils of 0 0.204 of solution of sodium hydroxide was used. The mixture was boiled to ensure complete reaction, okay? So you said that this was three times 300 milligrams. The excess sodium hydroxide solution was titrated with hydrochloric acid as follows. 20 mils of the solution from step one was pipetted into a conical flask and 0.125 mils of hydrochloric acid was placed in the burette. Indicator phenophanin was used in an average of 17.89 mils of hydrochloric acid. So calculate the number of moles of sodium hydroxide added in step one. That should be quite easy. N equals C times V. You're told C is 0 0.204. You're told B is 0 0.1. So it's simply 0 0.0204 moles. Now to calculate how many reacted with the aspirin, you're going to really need to do step two, which is look at the titration. So you've got sodium hydroxide titrated with hydrochloric acid. Of course, that's going to give you sodium chloride but plus H2O, which we don't really need to know the right-hand side. So I'll just leave that out to save space here. We should write it in the exam. 20 mils of the solution from step one. Okay, so we'll take 20 mils of solution of sodium hydroxide with unknown concentration was then prepared and used a hydrochloric acid whose concentration is 0 0.125. And we found the titra required was 17.89 mils. We can of course work out the number of moles of HCl by taking C times V. Keep in mind, of course, that it's milliliters, not liters, which is therefore 2.23 times 10 to the negative 3. And that's the number of moles of HCl. Therefore, the number of moles of NaOH that titrated was also 2.23 times 10 to the negative 3. But this is the amount that is titrated, which means that's the amount that's left after you reacted it with the aspirin. So the number of moles that reacted with the aspirin is the number of moles that you added from the start minus the number of moles that is left, which is of course 0 0.0204 minus 2.23 times 10 to the negative 3. which means the answer is 0 0.018 moles that reacted. So each aspirin molecule contains two hydroxide ions for complete reaction. Calculate the percentage by mass in one aspirin tablet where the molar mass of aspirin is 180.154 grams per mole. So we know basically that you're going to have aspirin so to speak, plus your um, two NaOH to, to sort of neutralize. So we know the number of moles of this is 0 0.018. Therefore, the number of moles of aspirin is going to be half of that. 
So now that we know the number of moles of aspirin, we now can then work out the mass of aspirin, which is the number of moles times the molar mass, which is that number times 180.154, giving us an answer of 1.63 grams. Which is rather problematic. Um, because we should get an answer of less than 0 0.9 grams. So whatever number we get from here, we really should be taking this number and then dividing it by so the percentage would be hypothetically 1.63 grams divided by the total mass, which was 0 0.9, which clearly doesn't work here. So that suggests that we've made a mistake somewhere, maybe a calculation error somewhere. However, that's definitely how you would should be doing it. Aspirin requires 200. So we talk about the number of moles. Number of moles. So I'm not seeing where the mistake is at the moment. Perhaps you might better find that for homework. Now, I will forward you um, some further review to do, just both in terms of exercises and in terms of um, review. So um, are there any other questions at the moment? Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Yep. Um, if I keep doing questions and questions uh like what is the possible raw mark you can get in hsc you can get 100 <laughs> no no like uh, uh I, I don't know how to ask this question but is it is that possible to get like 90 raw marks you can get 100 in raw marks that's not <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>